Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. It is Luke's story of the transfiguration of Jesus. This is transfiguration of the Lord's Sunday, which in our liturgical year always occurs on the Sunday before Lent begins, the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. So if you'd like to follow along as I read, I'd invite you to do so at this time. It is in the New Testament on page 843. Let's all listen for God's word to us today. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. The late preacher, Fred Craddock, once played a little game with his congregation to try and help everyone to understand the importance of context when hearing a biblical text. The importance of context when hearing a biblical text. The game goes like this. I'm going to make a statement about George. And I would like for you to get a picture in your mind of what is going on with George. And then after, I'm going to take a vote to see how many of you vote for different pictures. The statement is this. George will be released at 12.30 p.m., at which time his girlfriend will pick him up and they will go to lunch. Now, where is George? Where is George? How many people vote for the hospital? few of you? All right. How many vote for prison? All right. How many vote for George being in a church sanctuary listening to a sermon that went on too long? (laughs) Couple of you. No, No comment. To understand something about George, context makes all the difference, right? Context makes the difference. Silly little exercise, but We do not need a hypothetical example to know how this is true in our day-to-day lives. One of the places I think it is most true is with music. Have you ever had the experience of hearing a piece of music and being transported by that music to a different context, another place, another time? I remember the time in a previous congregation When I was choosing the hymns for worship one Sunday, one of the hymns that I was going to choose was His Eye is on the Sparrow. Do you know that hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow? It was a hymn, I thought, all right, I like this hymn, and it fit the text for that day, but our music director saw it, and she asked that I not choose it. Why? You don't like this hymn? No, she said, that's not it. Then she said, that hymn was sung at my brother's funeral. In fact, she said, I sang that hymn at my brother's funeral, and I cannot sing it in church anymore. Just a hymn, right? Just a hymn, his eye is on the sparrow. No, no, no. Given that context, much more than just a hymn. 
I raise the subject of context today because if there is any biblical text that I believe depends entirely on its context, it is our story today from Luke, the transfiguration of Jesus. A story about a mountaintop experience for the three disciples in this text and for Jesus. A story about the beautiful and wonderful and mysterious glory of God. As Luke tells it, Peter, James, and John go up on a mountain with Jesus. And when they get to the top, Jesus starts to pray. While he is praying, his appearance, the appearance of Jesus' face changed, Luke writes, and his clothes became dazzling white. And then the disciples see Elijah, who's been dead for hundreds of years, and they see Moses, who's been dead for over a thousand years, and Luke writes, they appeared in glory. Now, the most common interpretation I hear of this story is that the disciples had a mountaintop experience, and the glory of God appeared, and they just wanted to live and stay in that glory, but Jesus made them go back down the mountain. I think, I think, there's a bit more to this story than that. Do you know what the context is for this text? Listen to Luke 9, 22, just a few verses before our text. Jesus tells the disciples, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed. Now listen to Luke 9, 44, just a few verses after our text. Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. And do you remember, within the text itself, what Jesus and Elijah and Moses are talking about on that mountain, Luke is the only gospel writer who lets us know the subject of their conversation. Luke writes that they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus' departure. In other words, his cross, his suffering, his death. Do, do you see what's going on here? On the one hand, the disciples have this glorious, dazzling experience of God. On the other hand, that experience is surrounded by talk about suffering, about Jesus' suffering, before the story, after the story, within the story. Luke reminds us that Jesus is going to suffer. It seems to me that Luke is telling us that these two things belong together. The glory of God on the one hand, the suffering of Jesus on the other hand. What do you think? Do they belong together? Whether it's Jesus' suffering or the world's suffering or your suffering, do these two opposite experiences ever go together? Many years ago, a reporter from the British Broadcasting Corporation interviewed an American television preacher. The preacher stated that Jesus was the most successful religious figure of all time. Just consider it, he said. He began in obscure surroundings amid poverty and despair. And today, his followers outnumber those of any other world religion. That's astounding. But I thought he ended up on a cross. The interviewer said, oh no, replied the preacher, the cross was something he had to endure, as any successful person must endure hardships, but he rose from the dead, he overcame the cross, and he put all that behind him. Just put all that suffering stuff behind him. What do you think? I don't know about you, but I don't think that's how it works. Not for Jesus not for us. I believe you and I are shaped by suffering, <clears throat> molded by our difficult experiences in ways that are sometimes too profound for us to articulate. Some of you may recall that between the years 2001 and 2005, HBO aired a critically acclaimed show called Six Feet Under. 
The show was about a family that ran a mortuary. It ran for five seasons and won, among other awards, nine Emmys and three Golden Globes. Alan Ball, the show's creator, was interviewed by Terry Gross of NPR shortly after Six Feet Under premiered. In that interview, Ball recounted the genesis for the show. How does one come up with the idea for a black comedy drama about the mortuary business? In Ball's case, it came from a very personal and painful experience in his own life. When Alan Ball was 13, his 22-year-old sister was driving him to a music lesson. Their car was broadsided by another car, and his sister tragically was killed. It was a before and after event for Alan Ball, changing his life in numerous ways. But one of the things that stood out for him was how so many people did not want to deal with the grief and the pain and the suffering that came with it. For example, he learned of his sister's death from the family physician who happened to be driving him home to his parents and told him on the way that he would have to be strong for his parents. In other words, bury your pain and get tough, as if that was sound medical advice for a 13-year-old whose sister had just died. And when the family was at the funeral home and his mother was weeping at the casket of her daughter, his mom got loud, too loud in the opinion of some of the funeral home workers, and Ball's mother was escorted to another room so she could, quote, compose herself. In short, the message that Alan Ball received from many grown-ups at the time of his sister's death was that grief should be quiet and subdued, private and muffled, hidden behind a curtain in an adjacent room. That's a lie, he said to Terry Gross. What you need to do is scream, bang on a wall, tear at your hair, because grief is a primal thing, and the only way out of it is through it. The only way out of it is through it. You, you may think we've traveled some distance now from our beautiful and dazzling text, but I do not think that's the case. Chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel is filled with Jesus talking about what's going to happen next. A sneak preview, if you will, for his disciples. On the one hand, Jesus is revealed in glory on the mountain. On the other hand, Jesus says that he is going to suffer. The disciples are being asked to hold these two together. But not just those disciples, also these disciples. Can, can we hold these two together? Please do not misunderstand, I hope you have not heard me say, that whatever suffering you and I might go through, God intended for it to happen. That's not what I mean when I ask whether God's glory and suffering go together. To say that suffering or some extraordinarily difficult and painful event in your life was planned by God or premeditated by God, that just makes God cruel and capricious, in my opinion. Sometimes things happen in life that are not a part of anyone's plan, not yours, not mine, not God's. When I ask whether suffering and God's glory go together, what I mean is this. If we only look for God and God's glory in the places where life looks dazzling, the beautiful mountaintop experiences, the baptism of your child, the marriage of your daughter, if we only look for God there, then we have not listened to Jesus. What does God tell the disciples at the transfiguration from the cloud? This is my son, my chosen Listen to him. <laughs> and why would those disciples be tempted not to listen to Jesus? Because of what Jesus has just told them. You see, 
Jesus has just told them not only that he will suffer, but also that they will suffer. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 23. That is the context of this text as well. In other words, it's a difficult road ahead for the disciples, not because they've ignored Jesus, not because they've disobeyed Jesus, but because they are followers of Jesus. Barbara Brown Taylor once imagined what would happen if we we welcomed people to worship in the following way every Sunday. Hello, it is so lovely to see all of you here. My message will be brief and to the point. God is not in the business of protecting us from harm, and no amount of good behavior will keep you safe. Instead, God is in the business of restoring us to life, which may involve some painful procedures. If we are willing to go through with it and the operation is successful, our lives will not belong to us anymore. If the operation is really successful, our good works will get us killed. Do you think I should start every worship service like that from now on? As Taylor says, That'll clear a church out real fast. The glory of God revealed in Jesus. The cross we're asked to carry as followers of Jesus. The transfiguration says these two go together. And sometimes, sometimes we run across people who show us that it's true. In 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, I have known very few quiet days in the past few years. I have been arrested five times. My home has been bombed twice. And yet, writes King, my personal trials have taught me the value of unmerited suffering. Unearned suffering is redemptive. King writes, the suffering and agonizing moments through which I have passed over the past few years have also drawn me closer to God. (laughs) But it doesn't have to be someone like King who shows us the way. I think anyone in our church community can show us the way. I recall a couple I used to know. They were members of the first church that I served in Texas. They had a daughter, and then they had a second daughter. But something happened during the birth of their second daughter. A rare condition, her diaphragm would not automatically move to make her breathe. So there was a lot of fear and a lot of worry, a lot of expensive equipment, and a tracheotomy was required as well. I recall the father coming before the session one evening and offering his faith reflections before that group. It was a couple years after that second daughter had been born. He said to us that most people approach him and his wife and assume that the question that goes through their minds is, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? He said the question, that he and his wife ask is slightly different. Why not me? After all, they had the resources to handle this child, to care for this child, to give their child the love that this child would need growing up and throughout her life. Why not me? Was the question that they asked. Years ago, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote, official preaching has falsely represented Christianity as nothing but consolation, and consequently, doubt has the advantage. If Christianity, Kierkegaard wrote, were truthfully presented as suffering, ever greater as one advances further in it, doubt would be disarmed. I was at a meeting a few weeks ago with a philanthropic organization here in Greenville. We were talking about the needs of Greenville, affordable housing, that kind of thing. 
One of the participants invited me to share my vision for Westminster with that group. Well, I mentioned something to him about us getting out of our bubbles. We all have bubbles, right? Silos that we like to live in, whether it's how we use our money or how we spend our time or what conversations we choose to have and not to have. We, we all have bubbles, comfort zones, perhaps is a better way to say it, comfort zones in which we spend our days. And I believe that Jesus today tells us that we need to step outside of those comfort zones. So I'm really looking forward to the session retreat this coming weekend at Montreat. It will be my first trip ever to Montreat. I've heard wonderful things about it. Why am I looking forward to it? Not just because of Montreat. I'm looking forward to discussing our collective vision for the future of our church with our session and with our pastoral staff. I'm looking forward to talking about the strengths of our church, the growth of our church, the wonderful number of children we have at our church, and that excellent history of loving our neighbor as ourselves that we have at this church that goes back decades. You know what I'm also looking forward to? I'm looking forward to the moment when one of our session members says, here is Westminster's comfort zone, and here is Jesus. And Ben, I think that Jesus is calling us this way. Of course, you do not have to wait to hear what the discussion at the session retreat was like. You can talk about this topic right now. You can talk about it with your family tonight. You can talk about it with fellow church members after worship today. Where is your comfort zone right now? How many of you are sitting in basically the same seat you sit in every Sunday? Where is your comfort zone? Where is Westminster's? And where is Jesus calling us to go? More specifically, what cross is Jesus asking us to carry? You know, if there were ever a Presbyterian church with the strength and the resources and the leadership, lay leadership, pastoral leadership in place to take some chances, to be willing to fail, to step into the suffering of the surrounding community in some new and important way, Westminster is that church. I don't know yet what that step will look like. I do know this. My former parishioner had it right. Why not you? Why not me?